think he was being prophetic. Good morning. How's everyone doing? Y'all pray for Pastor Donnell. He is in Augusta, Georgia, uh, speaking to one of our Every Nation churches down there. So keep him in your prayers. Um, I'm excited. I'm excited to, to talk today um, because I think the Lord wants to help us. I think he wants to help us in our perception of him. And I think he wants to help us with respect to our proclamation about him. Um, I want to put a picture up on the screen. So who, who knows what this picture is? Who, who's ever? Anybody? Online, you can chat. You can chat in the, in the chat if you know what it is. So this is a picture from a book series called Where's Waldo? Anyone remember that? So Where's Waldo was a book series that came out in the 80s. And uh, as the only child growing up in my house, I routinely had to find ways to spend my time. And so I would do these Where's Waldo books. I would go through these books, and I got pretty good at finding Waldo. <clears throat> Somebody's pointing. You found him already? That is impressive. No one in the first service was able to find Waldo. Um, you, were you an only child, too? Okay, anyway. So when I, was, when I was younger, I got pretty good at finding Waldo. This time, it's been about 30 years since I actually looked at one of these. This time, it took me about 12 minutes to actually find Waldo. But you can go to the next slide, and there's Waldo. There's Waldo, and Waldo normally has on glasses and a red hat, and he's normally waving and smiling. Um, but it is very difficult to find that little man in the midst of everything that's happening in this picture, right? Among all of these cartoons and characters and objects, it can be very difficult to find something that small, something that blends in that well. The only way you get good at finding Waldo is you got to do this a lot. You got to look at Waldo. You got to know what Waldo looks like. If you don't know what you're looking for, it'll be extremely difficult to find Waldo in this picture. How many of you know I'm not talking about Waldo anymore? I got really good at finding Waldo. And as believers, I wonder what it would look like for us to get really good at finding God. What it would look like for us to get really good at finding God among all of the things that build up in our lives. What it would look like to get really good at finding God amidst all the noise in the culture, all the, the images, all of the likes and the news cycles and the, and the posts and the dislikes and the you chat with the, the, the emojis and the what other social media things that people do, the reposts and the tweets. What would it look like to find God, to be able to recognize God amidst all of the tweets and the retweets? It takes us training our eyes to do so. We got to look at him such that we know what he looks like so well that we're able to pick him out among all of the things that bombard us every day. And so I'm going to piggyback on Pastor Rich's sermon from last week because it was so good. The title of Pastor Rich's sermon was Faith to See Through the How. The title of this sermon, even though we're not in a sermon series, we effectively are in a sermon series now, the title of this sermon is Faith to See Through the Now. What does it look like to have faith to see through the now? Where is God? Where is God? And so I want to look at Acts 17, verses 22 through 28. Acts 17, 22 through 28. This is Luke. Uh, Luke wrote Acts. Luke was not an apostle, but he spent time with Paul. So this is likely from a, a personal account with Paul or probably from someone that was close to Paul, that was a part of that crew. Um, so this is Luke writing, Acts 17, 22 through 28. It says, so Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. 
The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I pray you would help us today, Lord. Help us to glean something from it. Help us to find you in it. In your name we pray, amen. Uh, so brief background. So Paul is in Athens. Paul was not even supposed to be in Athens. Um, on his journey, he was in Thessalonica, and he had experienced persecution. Um, because of that persecution, the, the people that he was with said, okay, let's, let's go to Berea. He went to Berea. They experienced more persecution. The people from Thessalonica, Thessalonica actually followed him to Berea. This is how much they did not like Paul. And then, so while in Berea, they said, okay, Paul... The folks that he was traveling with, they said, okay, why don't you go to Athens and just lay low for a while, right? Chill out. Um, whatever the Greek is for chill out. I don't know how that's translated. But they say, why don't you go to Athens for a while? So Paul ends up in Athens. Um, but how many of you know Paul cannot lay low? <laughs> how many of you know Paul cannot chill out? So Paul ends up in Athens. And Athens is a beautiful city. Athens is a city known for its art, known for its uh, magnificent architecture, uh, on the screen behind me, that, that sort of central figure you see at the top is the Parthenon. It's the temple that was devoted to the goddess Athena, right? This is, this is the city that Paul is in. Um, and so as he's walking through the city, he, while looking at the art and the architecture of the city, notices that temples like this, this one as well as a bunch of other temples and altars, are all devoted to idols. The city's full of idols. And it says that his spirit was provoked such that he began to preach in the marketplace, open air preaching. And so as he's preaching in the marketplace, some philosophers, because Athens at this time in the world was sort of this like philosophical hub of the world. So philosophers would come to Athens and they would debate the latest and greatest ideas of the day. And so they hear Paul preaching the gospel, but they refer to it as, they refer to him as a babbler. Like, what are these ideas that, that this man is saying? And so they, they take him, they invite him to come and speak to the Oropagus. The Oropagus is basically a council of philosophers that essentially, you know, um, dictate the, the moral and religious order of the day. And so this is where we pick up. So Paul is now speaking to the Oropagus, and he says, you know, uh, men of Athens, right? I see that in every way you're very religious, for I, I, I noticed an altar among you to an unknown God. When I read that, the first thing that comes to my mind is, man, what kind of perception must you have that in the midst of all of these idols, even if you were to remember what that Where's Waldo picture looked like, what kind of perception must you have to be able to see God, to be able to find, identify this altar to an unknown God and to be able to make that connection? There's something that God wants to do in this city, and I'm going to use that altar. Even though it's to an unknown God, I'm going to proclaim to you who that God actually is. What kind of perception must you have? I argue that Paul's eyes were trained to find God. They were trained to find God. And I tell you what, to be able to see through all of the beauty, you, you're looking at the Temple of Athena. Imagine how beautiful that thing was, sun shining down on it. Back then it was all intact, it wasn't crumbled. To be able to see through the beauty and not be so in awe that you realize that this very thing is actually flying against the very fabric of what I believe. I tell you, God has blessed many of us. 
um, I can look at some of you and I can recall some of the blessings in your lives. Indeed, one might say that many of us have beautiful lives, but may it never be that we get so caught up in the beauty of our blessings that our blessings actually become our idols. This was a beautiful city, but it was full of idols. God wants to tear down some idols in our lives. I believe that. He wants to purge some things. And so Paul perceived. He saw through the idols. He saw through the noise. He saw through the followers. He saw through the likes and the dislikes and the tweets. He saw through all of it. He saw through all the anxiety and the fear and the sorrow and all the things that build up in our lives. All the things that build up in our lives. All the unforgiveness. The things that we walk around with on a daily basis that we become accustomed to. We think we're supposed to be afraid. We think we're supposed to be anxious. We, we walk with a limp and don't even realize that we're limping. This is how stuff builds up in our lives. We have an island, a kitchen island in our house. Not an actual island. It'd be great if we had an actual island. I might not. I'd be preaching from the island right now. But we have a kitchen island in our kitchen. And anyone who's ever had an island knows that inevitably, whether it's an island, whether it's a coffee table, whatever it is, inevitably things end up on this island. Clutter. It might be mail. It could be half-drank water bottles, cups and paper cups and all kinds of stuff, right? Ends up on this island. And you end up walking by it every single day such that it becomes a part of the backdrop. You don't even realize that this island is full of stuff. Half of it, you don't even know how it got there, what it's there for. You got pre-approval letters from credit card companies from six months ago. You're probably not even approved anymore, but it's still there, right? All this stuff ends up on your island. This stuff ends up on your island. This stuff ends up in your lives. There's stuff that kind of builds up in our lives. We, we think when we're watching television or when we're surfing the internet, we're just kind of, you know, glancing and things are going by. But guess what? We're picking up stuff. We're picking up fear. We're picking up anxiety. We're picking up anger. We're picking up unforgiveness. We're picking up all this stuff. And then we, we're walking around with all this stuff in our lives, not even realizing that it needs to be purged. It needs to be purged. And so every now and then we'll purge the island and we realize, man, that's actually a nice looking island. Right? Guess what? You, you, have, a, you have a nice looking life without that relationship. You have a nice looking life without that fill in the blank. That thing that you've been walking around with that is not for you to carry. God wants to free you up in that way. He wants to purge some things from your life. And I believe our perception, our ability to see God rests in part on our openness to allow him to remove some of the clutter, to remove some of the clutter. Paul was able to see through the clutter of the idols and identify where God was at work in that city. May it be that we can see through the clutter. Sometimes we have to remove it, get quiet with him, sit with him in silence, and allow him to speak to us such that we can hear his voice without all of the noise. Amen? God wants to fix our perception. He wants to remove the clutter in our lives. He also wants to help us in our proclamation. Paul proclaimed. So we talked about how he perceived. Now we're talking about how he proclaimed. He said, what therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. You know, with respect to a proclamation, you know, we speak differently about people that we know versus people that we don't know. Is that fair? I can, I can speak about, you name the actor or athlete, Denzel Washington, right, or Stephen Curry. Like, I can speak about these people, but I don't know them. So I can speak about them in a way that's very general, in a way that you probably hear about them on television, but I can't speak about them the same way that maybe their best friend might be able to speak about them. Or I can't speak about them in the way that their wife or their husband or, or et cetera, et cetera, might be able to speak about them. And so there's a way that we speak about someone that we know that is different than someone that we don't. 
And so even as Paul is making this proclamation, he's not just preaching about a God that is abstract. He's not just speaking, preaching about a God that is objective. He's actually introducing his friend. What does that look like for our proclamation to be so intimate that our speaking about the Lord, our inviting him into our relationships, our inviting him into our world is just as natural as introducing a friend. Imagine walking into a dinner party, right? You walk into a dinner party, you got a guest or a friend or, you know, whoever's with you, and you walk into that party and a party host comes up to you and they're, and they're like, hey, can I take your coat? Thank you for coming, et cetera, et cetera. And your response is, the natural response would be, yes, great, I'm, thank you for inviting me. Hey, you, here's my friend, you should meet so-and-so because that person's right next to you, right? It would be unnatural, it'd be unnatural to say, yes, thank you for inviting me. Right, that would be unnatural, that would be unnatural. What makes it so unnatural, what makes it so uncomfortable to speak about the Lord in the same way. Um, I have a couple of theories. I think part of what makes it unnatural is proximity. Proximity. When someone is standing right next to you, the natural thing to do is acknowledge that person. If someone's sitting way across the room, maybe not so much. Our proximity to God actually fuels our proclamation. The closer we are to him, the more inclined we'll be to speak about him. The closer we are to him, the, the, the better we'll actually know him. We'll actually know how to introduce him, what things to say. Hey, you know, you should meet Jesus because, you know, he did it. He back 2000 years ago, he kind of did this thing. He did a thing. Right, he did a thing, that's what people say now when they say, oh, I did a thing. You ever heard that? Which I don't understand it completely, because it's like I do things all the time, but how do you identify one thing over another? But anyway, it's like, this, you should meet him. That would be the inclination, because of our proximity to him. But what is it in us that's hindering that? It could be the fact that we didn't spend time with him this morning. The fact that I didn't read my Bible, right? right? Because all of us have been in that situation where you know, you know there's something that needs to be said. You know this person needs to hear the gospel. They need to hear about Jesus. But I didn't read my Bible this morning and I can't quite, I don't know how it's gonna come out and it's not the right environment and I like, ugh, it's a hitch. There's a hitch, there's a hitch. And so my prayer, my prayer is, Lord, remove the hitch. Lord, remove whatever in me that is hindering me in the, in the natural, hindering me from being able to proclaim you in the world. Because guess what? There's spiritual opposition that exists beyond your hitch. The, the, the opposition, the real opposition, is in that person's response. Because guess what? When Paul proclaimed to this group of people, there were some that responded in the affirmative, and there were some that did not. That's the spiritual opposition. There's a real devil, there's a real enemy who does not want you to proclaim. He doesn't want you to speak. And so he's at work. He's at work to stop that from happening. May it never be that I'm helping him with my own discomfort. May it never be that I'm helping him because of my distance from the Lord, no. My prayer is, Lord, make me as close to you that there's nothing in me that's causing a false step to be able to proclaim you to the world. Chris was a linebacker. He knows how important that first step is, right? That first step, that read step, can be all the difference between you making the play and you not. And so we work so much on removing the false step, removing that false step, right? Your first step needs to be forward. I know I'm speaking like foreign language now, I'm getting a little, I was, yeah. But anyway, so let's remove the hitch. Let's remove the hitch. 
Our proximity fuels our proclamation, but it is extremely difficult to make a proclamation without information. It's extremely difficult to make a proclamation about something without information. I could not stand here and begin to speak to you about uh, astrophysics or some complex topic because I don't, ha I don't know about that. I don't, I, that's not, I'm not an astrophysicist, right? What, if you were to ask me to, to make a proclamation about Del Frisco's butter cake, I could do that. I could do that because I have information. I've experienced it. I've tasted it, right? I can tell you how long it takes. To, to, you got you to get home in a certain period of time before the ice cream melts. You got to put it in the microwave for a certain period of time. That's information that I have. Right, so that information fuels my proclamation. But if we don't have information about God, we can't make a proper introduction. And so where's one of the best places we get information about God? Anyone wanna guess? There you go, someone held it up, right? The Word, the Word of God. It is his love letter to us. It is the primary way in which he communicates to us. It's actually his Word because of some very gracious, very smart people over the course of history translated into language that we understand, right? But guess what? These pages are just that, pages with ink on them, right? If you were to ball up a page and throw it in the trash, that page is not gonna jump out the trash can and jump back in the book, right? But what the words are on these pages are words that actually marry up with his speaking voice that is speaking in the world. God has never stopped speaking to his creation, into his creation, since the beginning of time. So even today, when we talk about where's God, how to see God through the now, guess what? God is speaking. He is hiding in plain view. But we have to know the words so that the words that we actually understand can marry up with the word that's being spoken in the earth, such that we're, when we're in the now, when we're in the now, we're able to recognize what's being said because a scripture comes to mind and your spirit's provoked, just as Paul's was, to be able to marry up what you read to what's actually being spoken. In the beginning, when God spoke his word into creation, it says that the, the earth was formless and without void. Or, or, or it, uh, it was formless, there was a void, there was darkness, and he spoke his word into that, such that, guess what? The earth is no longer formless, and it's no longer void, and it's no longer dark, but his word is now permeating throughout the earth. This is why we have to know it, so that when it comes to mind, we can hear it, we can marry it up. My nephew, I was with him a couple of weeks ago, and he asked me, he said, Uncle B, when people say that they... they, they uh, they heard God speak, or they heard the voice of God. Like, what does that mean? And, you know, I couldn't help but think about statements that we, we all know, like people, coaches, teachers have made statements to you, and such that if you were to hear that statement come from someone else or see it written down somewhere, it actually, you, you almost hear the voice of the person that originally said it. Does that make sense? Right? I have coaches that have said things to me throughout my life that if I were to see that statement written down, I can actually hear that coach's voice in my head. If I were to say, family, right? You know that, not because I said it, you know that because Pastor D has said it, and if you were to see that phrase written on a piece of paper, you could almost hear his voice saying it. This is what happens when we read the word of God. Now, do I believe some people hear the voice of God audibly? I do. Has that ever happened for me personally? I can't say it has, but what I do hear is that when I read his word, the same quiet voice with which I read his word actually marries up with his speaking voice in the earth, and I hear that. I hear the scriptures come to mind when my spirit is provoked from one circumstance to another. God is speaking. He is speaking but you have to know what he's saying. You have to know what he's saying. You have to be able to identify what he's saying and where he's at work in your now, in your circumstance. He wants us to hear at a higher frequency, just like a dog whistle, right? Dogs can hear something that no one else can hear. 
As Paul was walking through Athens, he was able to see at a different frequency. That's how he recognized God. We got to get before him in our quiet. We have to allow him to purge some of the things out of our lives, some of the, the clutter, the things that distract us from him, and we got to get in his word. That's how we come to recognize Waldo. <laughs> that's how we come to recognize, that's how we come to know what God looks like, what God sounds like, so that we can identify him among all of the stuff. Amen? And uh, in 2007, I left one company. Um, I was working, this was two, I was two years out of college, and uh, I left one company to go to another company. And the reasons I left were all superficial. They had to do with the sort of the, the glitz and the glamour of the job, or so I thought, right? I was gonna get to wear a suit to work every day and a tie, and I was gonna get to be around people with a lot of money, and, and, uh, and I thought that was what I wanted. Um, this was 2007. Uh, that job was the stockbroker, right? Now, if you remember 2007, that was probably the worst time to become a stockbroker. And so for the next two years of my life, everything went down. The economy went down. My self-confidence went down. My sense of achievement and accomplishment went down. Indeed, I felt like a failure at the end of 2008, such that I had to leave that job and go back to my old company. It was humiliating. It was humiliating. In the literal sense of the word, I had to humble myself to go back to the same boss <laughs> and ask for a job. It felt like I was going backwards. And at that time, I'd also met a man, Pastor Donnell, who had introduced the gospel to me in a fresh way for the first time. And so even though I was appreciative that I now had this um, consciousness, I still wasn't at the place where I understood what God was doing. Indeed, I was asking the question, where is God in all of this? because I'm going backwards. I'd racked up a bunch of credit card debt, right? Trying to be someone that, trying to be someone that I thought people wanted me to be, putting things on tabs and it was, it was terrible. God literally, in hindsight I realized, God literally plucked me out of downtown DC and put me in Southern Maryland. Nothing wrong with Southern Maryland, love Southern Maryland. If anyone's from Southern Maryland, I love it. But Southern Maryland was the complete antithesis, antithesis of downtown DC. And I was way down Southern Maryland. I'm talking St. Mary's County. This is where I was based. Didn't get to wear a suit. Had no need for a credit card. I was plucked out of those environments. No more happy hours for me. And I could not understand how God was taking me from what I thought was the glamour and the glitz and, the, and, the, and all the things that a professional should be to now basically just clocking in. And there was one afternoon at a Panera Bread in Southern Maryland where I found myself reading John 17. And it's the moment where Jesus is praying for his disciples and he is effectively praying for us, those that would come after his disciples. And I begin to weep. I begin to cry right there in the Panera Bread. And I realized in that moment that even as Paul says that they should seek God, perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he's actually not far from each one of us. I realized that in that moment, God was never far from me. I was far from him. My proximity was hindering my relationship with him. My proximity was hindering my peace with him. And in that moment, 
I came to a point of realizing that God had literally purged my life because it needed to be. Prior to that, I didn't see him. I couldn't see where, I couldn't see why, I couldn't see how, I couldn't see through the now of it all. But in that moment, when I began to cry, right there in that Panera Bread, I don't know if anyone saw me, no one came up to me, but I'm talking tears, weeping, coming down in the, in the middle of Panera Bread, I realized in that moment what God was doing, that he had purged things from my life that didn't need to be there. I believe there's a purging that needs to take place. Um, and I believe that there is um, a closeness that God wants to have with every single one of us. But that takes a statement of faith. It takes a declaration of faith. If anyone's ever been to a 3D movie when movie theaters were open, if anyone's ever been to a 3D movie and you tried to take those 3D glasses off, what does the screen look like? It looks blurry, right? You can still kind of follow the movie, but it's not a pleasant experience. It looks blurry. You put the 3D glasses on, now things make sense. This is what a statement of faith does for us. The pursuit of God is not an academic pursuit. If it is, if you make it that, it'll be incomplete. You'll be looking at a blurry picture. Not until, it's not until we make that declaration that we say, God, I want you to help me see. God, I want to trust you with my life. I'm trusting that as you take things away, you're gonna restore what needs to be restored. I'm trusting that as I draw near to you, as I seek you and feel my way toward you, that you're gonna find me, you're gonna grab hold of my hand. This is the statement of faith that we have to make. God wants us to see him through the now. He wants us to see, he wants you to see him through all of the circumstances, all of the stuff. He wants to raise our perception of him to a higher frequency. But we gotta respond in faith. Amen? If you've never responded that way, if you've never made that declaration, if you've never declared to him, Lord, help me to see you in a new way, if you've never declared him as Lord of your life, if you've never trusted him with your life, I'm going to invite you to do that. And raising your hand even takes faith. It takes faith to get that hand up in the air. But I'm going to invite you to do that. If you've never done that, go ahead and raise your hand. I want to pray with you. There are people here that can help. Even if you're at a place where you're not really sure about this faith, this, this God thing, is he real, is he not? Um, you know, there's a, there's a man named Rice Brooks who say, says, if you're running from God and you're here, you're probably not doing a great job. <laughs> and so if you're here, he, you're here for a reason. And so if that's you, if you're praying it for the first time, if you're making that for the first time, raise your hand. And I want to pray for us. Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that you want to reveal yourself to us. You want us to see you in the now of our circumstances. You want us to see you through all the clutter. You want us to see you through all of our hurts, pain, fear. You want us to see you through it all and you're hiding in plain view. You're not far from each one of us. In fact, you've never been far. You're screaming into your creation. Indeed, you screamed yourself into your creation when you became a man, Jesus Christ. You saw that there was a problem, a gap that we couldn't will ourselves over, that we couldn't do good ourselves over. But you, the creator of heaven and earth, screamed yourself into creation and became a bridge for us to get to you. So Lord, I pray you would 
give us the faith to walk over that bridge. Lord, I pray you would give us the eyes to see where you're at work in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. Help our perception, Lord, that we would be able to proclaim you rightly. In Jesus' name, amen.